Well, God is not a man. That is true. This is what I wanted to study about it and be able to come to a place of understanding the distinction between God and man. First and foremost, we need to understand that man is created. That is a biblical proof of the same. In Genesis 1, 26, God said, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. That is to say that God said, let us be able to make man, but let them have our image and our likeness. Let them act. Let them have those qualities that are always, that are within us. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So God's choice for human creation was to reflect his character while he operates within the earth frame. But having said that, we don't understand that as much as man was created in the image and the likeness of God, man could not in totality operate the way that God operates because man was planted after created by God, man was placed within the earth realm, and the earth realm was sufficient enough to contain mankind. While God is not simply contained in that which He created, God created the entire universe, the entire creation. But the Bible says in John chapter number one, verse number one, that in the beginning was the world even before beginning began because God began beginning so God was there before time numerically began to unfold before the chronos and the kairos began to unfold God was there so everything emanated from God and therefore man came as a result of God and man was planted within the earth realm so man had certain limits and as much as he had the privilege and still holds the privilege through the person of Christ to simply operate in some degree, in some percentage like God, but not in totality. Now, I want us to be able to establish the fact why the Bible says that God is not a man, that he should lie. Of course, the worst happened when Adam and Eve were basically this deceived by Satan that in Genesis chapter number three and of course they disobeyed God's commandment which God had instructed Adam regarding the tree in the garden of Eden we know the story very well chronologically so after that even things became worse of course Paul recalls and says that for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory that is every human being under their dynamic nature because every human being that came after Adam had what we call the fallen nature. And therefore they could not hold the standard, the quality, the purity, the holiness of God Almighty. And so if you study the entire human race and the unfolding of human race throughout generations, you'll be able to simply look at the consistency of the fallen nature of mankind from the Old Testament even to the New Testament even before Christ came and even after Christ came he provided salvation to mankind and there are those who have been able to believe and there are those who have been able to kind of you know refuse to believe and of course salvation is a personal choice you don't simply impose it on someone John 3 16 says for God loved the world that he gave his only begotten and started whoever believes is a personal initiative in him should not perish so the provision of salvation is there because Jesus Christ died literally for every person every human being Christ paid the ultimate price of redemption and salvation so it's up to every human being regardless of you know your race your language your nationality Christ came for every human being and therefore the provision is still there that's the gospel is being preached that is not what I want us to discuss about I want to speak about God is not a man 
that he should lie. I just want to establish a few facts as regarding to mankind. Now, where do we simply find this particular statement? Of course, we do understand that the five books of the law were written by Moses. And there are a lot of things that was able to take to account from the time that God spoke to Abraham. You, know, you need to understand that Abraham, God was able to simply allow him to have the sevenfold blessings that was meant to simply benefit the entire human race. Because in Genesis chapter number 12, verse number 3, when God said, Through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. But we'll get to that later. Let us look at Numbers. The book of Numbers, Israelites were on their way to the land of the promise that God had promised Abraham. And now they had already just left Egypt. They're on their way to the land of Canaan, Moses being the leader. And of course, there were other people that were going along with Moses, inclusive of Joshua. And along the way, of course, they could encounter some enemies on the way. Sometimes they'll get into battles like the Malachites, you know, the Amorites and stuff like that. So they would really find themselves sometimes in the midst of battle and they'll fight against enemies and God will definitely give them victory because he had promised to be with them as uh, they were heading to the land of Canaan. Now at some point in time, uh, when you look at Gen Numbers 22 from verse number 1, the Bible the Israelites journeyed and encamped in the plains of Moreb on the east side of Jordan River at Jericho. And Balak the king of Moab, son of Zipporah, saw all the Israel, all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And the Moab was terrified, and Moab was terrified at the people, full of dread, because there were many. Moab was distressed and overcome with fear because of the Israelites. And Moab said to the elders of, the, of Midian, Now will this multitude lick up all that is around about as an ox licks up the grass of the field? So Balak son of Zippor, the king of Moabites, at that time sent messengers to Balaam, a foreteller of events, or fortune teller of events, son of Beor, at Bethel, which is the Euphrates River even to the land of the children of his people, to say, There is a people come out of from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth. They have settled down, dwell opposite me. Now come, I beg of you, cast these people from me, for they are too powerful for me. Perhaps I may be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that whom you bless is blessed and whom you curse is cursed. Now I want us to be able to establish a few things here. The Israelites had just taken some time to come opposite the Moabites and the king of Moabite. In those days when things would happen the story would spread across and of course Israelites was, the Israel, Israel as a nation was a big threat as it is today when it came to the nations of the world. Why? Because God has always been behind Israel just as he's together with the church today, the church of Christ. Now, when they were just camping without really taking uh, any notice that probably somebody is threatened by the presence, and in this case, we're talking about the king of Moab. And uh, so he, the, Moab, the king of Moab decided to simply discuss with his people, and they decided to look for uh, Balaam. Balaam by then was believed to be someone that could foretell things, that had ability to curse and to bless according to their own persuasions. And therefore in this particular case they said they wanted that curse to simply diffuse their ability but they never understood that the Israelites were not subject to themselves, they were subject to God. And so Balak uh, had to simply seek for Balaam 
and in read the entire story, he tried all that he can to be able to persuade Balaam to speak a curse, which of course was meant to simply uh, weaken the Israelites so that whatever they do, because anyone that is in the curse, no matter what you do, you don't simply progress, you don't even make headway. So because the curse is a negative force that simply suppresses you or oppresses you or deprives the ability to progress everything that you do, your hands, everything that you touch does not be able to excel. Why? Because that's what the curse does. And therefore they were trying to, he was trying to simply ask Balaam, please come and curse these people, they are too powerful. And what happened? The Bible says, so look at what uh, the Bible says. And the elders were seven, and the elders of Moab and Midian departed with the with the rewards of foretelling in their hands. They came to Balaam and told him the words of Balak. Now they are going to Balaam and they are carrying some rewards, like what would simply prompt Balaam to speak these rewards that are humanly given. So they were like, if we have these rewards, then Balaam will be able to give in easily because, of course, uh, one of the letters of Peter, Peter writes and said that actually Balaam, you know, he's, he's a man that liked the words of wickedness, you know, his greed. Now, uh, the Bible says here, and he said to them, Lord, here tonight, I'll bring you what as the Lord may speak to me. The prince of Moab abode with Balaam that night, and God came to Balaam and said, What men are these with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent me, saying, Behold, the people who came out of Egypt cover the face of the earth. Come now, cast them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to fight against them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not cast the people, for they are blessed. You will not cast the people because they are blessed. Now we'll be able to establish when were these persons blessed shortly. And Abram rose up in the morning and said, I'm sorry, and Balaam rose up in the morning and said to the princess of Balak, Go back to your own land, for the Lord refuses uh, to permit me to go with you. So God actually prohibited Balaam to go ahead of this person so that he can be able to simply, like in the pull a cast of the children of Israel. Balak again sent uh, the princes more of them and more honorable than the first ones. They came to Balaam say thus says Balak, I beg of you, let nothing hinder you from coming. I will promote you to a very great honor. I will do whatever you tell me. So come, I beg of you, cast these people for me. Now, it's very interesting to know that they were using the the athlete goodies, the athlete things, and most of them were simply, you know, the, the king was telling, you know, for his princess, they were telling Balaam that we're going to promote you to great honor. That means we're going to really grant you such a platform of honor among us. You're going to be highly regarded, highly respected as a person, highly honored. And some of those kind of persuasions, probably, Balaam could simply give in to that, but at the end of the day, could not do it because God had prohibited him to do. And sometimes uh, I find it very interesting. Sometimes, even as, as ministers of the gospel, sometimes you know these things can seem to blind us and they begin to speak that which maybe even God has not ordained us to speak. But that aside, because I'm not speaking about that now. So they try to persuade Balaam in all ways telling him good things, telling him how he shall be promoted, telling him how he shall be rewarded, you know, all those particular things. And of course, uh, remember, God has already warned Balaam the first time. And uh, Balaam answered Balak's servants, if Balak will give me 
his house full of silver and gold i cannot go beyond the word of the lord my god to do less or more so balak's balam says here that even if balak will give me you know uh his house full of silver and gold i cannot go beyond that means no matter what balak would like to do in terms of silver and gold so that i can be able to speak i'm limited i can't do beyond what god has already told me and look at what happened now therefore i pray you there again tonight that may know what more the lord will say and God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men call, come to call you, rise up and go with them, and but steal only what I tell you, you may do. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his donkey, went to the princess of Moab. And God's anger was kindled uh, because he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way adversary against him. Now he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. And the donkey saw an angel of the Lord standing on his way, and his sword drawn in his hand. The donkey turned its side out and went into the field, and Balaam struck the donkey to turn uh, her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, wall on his side, and the wall the other side when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself against the wall, crushed Balaam's foot again against it, and he struck her again. The angel of the Lord went farther and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down and Balaam, Alan Balaam's uh, and Balaam and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with his staff. And the Lord opened his mouth, of the, um, opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said, Bal to Balaam, "What have I done to you that you should strike me three, these three times?" Balaam said to the donkey, "Because you have ridiculed and provoked me, I wish there was a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you." The donkey said to Balaam, "I'm not a man, nor your donkey, upon which you have ridden all your life." long until this day was i ever accustomed to do so to you i said no the lord opened the balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the lord standing in the way with the sword drawn in his hand he bowed his head fell on his face the angel of the lord said to him why have you struck you donkey these three times i came to stand against you resist you from for your behavior is really fully obstinate and contrary before me and as the ass on me turned for me these three times, if she had not turned for me, surely I would have slain you and saved her life. But I'm said to the angel, Lord, I've sinned, for I did not know you stood on the way. But now if my going displeases you, I will return. Now if, if you read the entire uh, chapter the remaining verse you'll understand so i don't want us to simply dwell on that because still uh, balak decided to keep on persuading balaam to go and simply cast god's people now when you read the entire even chapter 23 now where you go to get to you realize the words of balaam again now the bible says verse 17 uh, and when he returned to Balak, his, he was standing beside his burnt offerings. And the princess moved with him, and Balak said to him, What has the Lord said? And Balaam took up his figurative discourse and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, listen closely to me, son of Zipporah. God is not a man that he should tell or act a lie, neither the son of man that he should feel repentance, compunction for what he has promised. Has he said he shall not do it? and he shall not do it or has he spoken and he shall not make it good you see i have received this command to bless israel he has blessed and i cannot reverse or qualify it uh, uh, or god has not be beheld iniquity in jacob for he is forgiven neither has he seen mischief or perverseness in israel Perverse, uh, the perverseness in Israel for the same reason the Lord their God is with Israel and shout praise to their king is among the people. God brought them from the 
from out of God bred them forth out of Egypt, they have as it were the strength of a wild orc. Surely there is no enchantment with or against Jacob, neither is there any divination with or against Israel in due season even now it shall be said Jacob and Israel what what has God wrought so now in this particular case you discover that Balaam was able not to explain in details after so many persistent sacrifices being offered seven altars being raised and bulls being slaughtered but nothing was forthcoming why because he could not simply go against what God had said. Why? Because here he came and simply brought out the point you're learning, the message you're learning about that God is not a man. God is consistent with what he says. Man is not. You know, it's very important for us to establish this because God made a promise to Abraham. We go to Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis chapter number 12, from verse number 1. And in Haran the Lord said to Abram, Go for yourself, for your own advantage, from your own country, from your country rather, from your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I'll make you great nation of bless those. I'll bless you with abundant increase of favors and make your name famous, distinguished, and it will be a blessing, dispensing good others. Verse 3, I'll bless those who bless you. Now you see that? I'll bless, this is God committed that I'll bless those who bless you. And also he has promised Abraham that he'll bless Abraham. Then he says, I'll bless those who bless you, confer prosperity and happiness upon you and curse him who curses or uses instant language towards you. In you will all the families of the earth be blessed, and by you they'll bless themselves. Now, God had already uh, spoken through Abraham and simply said that I'll bless you. This was not just going to be limited to Abraham, but it was going to simply affect the generations after Abraham as well. So, as they were headed to the land of Canaan, and all the way when Balaam was trying to speak a curse under the influence of Balak, it couldn't happen. Why? Because when God made a promise to Abraham, he could not simply lie. He made it crystal clear that I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you or use instant language against you. So it was not up to Abraham to defend himself or neither Israel. It was God who spoke, who made that promise to become the defender of Israel as they were going ahead. Because God knew that actually when a word is spoken negatively to persons or to any person, it could simply have an effect. But then in this particular case, God was always protecting the Israelites and simply making sure that nobody speaks contrary to what God had already established. So the consistency of God's word, the consistency of God's word, you know, was very obvious. The Bible says God has exalted his word above his name. And that's when we do understand very well. So the promise that God made in Israel was so sustained throughout different seasons, you know, and different encounters. God's word was still being sustained over Israel. And therefore, Balaam could not do anything against Israel. And they say that indeed for sure that whom God has blessed nobody can cast. And you know we as Christians, we have been simply redeemed after the order of Abraham because Christ emanated again also from Abraham. We do understand very well because God said, through you and your seed, which meant one person, through you and your seed, through you and your seed. Now the Bible says that actually, if you look at your Bible very well here, uh, in uh, Galatians chapter number 3, Galatians number 3 verse number 26, the Bible says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as many of you were baptized into Christ, do you know spiritually in communion with Christ, the anointed word, the Messiah have put on clothed yourself with Christ. There is no distinction between the Jew or Greek. There is no uh, neither slave nor free. There is no, uh, no male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ are in him who is Abraham's seed, then you are Abraham's offspring, spiritual heirs according 
to the promise now you see in Christ we are all one so the 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 closure of the seed of Abraham that means he spoke about Christ the Messianic promise and now when we get born again when we are in Christ we are one there is no male no female there is no Jew no Greek there is no all these things that we normally see in the world we are one in Christ and that's why God made a client simply say that you know that uh, through your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed so when God spoke and said that through that I'll bless you and bless those who bless you and cast those who cast you now when the Messianic promise was equally spoken you know God had to simply defend the children of Israel along the way as they were moving to the land of Canaan and I'll get to the point where I'm about to explain how you and me come in through the Messianic uh, for the fulfillment of the coming of Christ and the dying uh, the, cruci the crucifixion rather uh, the burial and the resurrection and how we come in and be able to benefit from this particular promise now back to the story of the Israelites so God made that promise and he said that uh, Balaam said that God is not a man that he should lie God is not a man that he should lie now let's look at Romans and let's look at what Paul said here chapter number three yeah Roman chapter three verse from lesson number three I know the context may be different but I just want us to simply get what Paul put across and helps to understand what if some did not believe and were without faith does their lack of faith and their faithfulness uh, faithlessness nullify and make ineffective the void the faithfulness of God and his fidelity to his word by no means let God be true though every human being is false or a liar as it is written that you may be justified and shown to be upright in what you say and prevail when you are judged by sinful men. So Paul say that, you know, in this particular context, because I was trying to talk about the faith and those who may be faithless and stuff, but the point that I wanted to simply focus was, Paul say that God cannot change who he is. He's consistent with his word. God and his word, they're bound. So whatever God says, that is who he is. His word cannot contradict his nature. The word of God and God himself, they're just one. Whatever God says, that is what is meant to happen. And nobody can separate that. So Paul says that even if people become faithless, don't believe in what God has said in his word, God will not change. He remains faithful to his word. Why? And he says, uh, let God be true and every human being be false or be a liar that's that's why the word has been used it's human so when you talk about a man it does not mean that actually male or just it's not a gender factor he that but the, the human species actually so when he said just like he said in genesis 1 26 let us make man in our own image and likeness so this is inclusive whether male or female you know human beings are bound to lie and so the bible says here that let God be true and all men be liars or false. So, have you ever noticed over time that even to us that are born again, sometimes the consistency of what we say cannot simply be accounted for because there are a lot of grayness in what we say sometimes. And, you know, we are being perfected day in, day out as time goes by. You know, sometimes people speak things and they don't simply honor what they say. Sometimes make people make promises and they don't honor what they promise. Why? Because God is not a man. So a man is bound to lie. And that's why 
When people make promises to you and they don't keep those promises, don't get offended. Don't get, don't feel bad. The Bible has made it clear. They don't have that assurance that they can simply keep up to what they're saying. And like God, when he speaks, he has seen and will keep his word that he has said. So there's a very big difference between man and God or between human beings and God. Politicians make promises in different parts of nations of the world. They don't honor those promises. Why? Because they can speak, but they're limited in their delivering what they said. Why? Because maybe circumstances are not favoring them. Maybe things are so tight they cannot simply fulfill what they promised to the persons. And you can blame them. That happens. They are human beings. Only God can be able to honor his word. He spoke to Abraham. He spoke to Israelites. And they were simply following up his word to defend it where Israel was concerned. To date, God is able to defend his word. Some of you, God has made promises to you, but you tend to believe what the devil is saying more, what people are saying more. Listen to me, circumstances always give a privilege to people to make conclusions about your life and about your destiny. But I'm here to say this today. Circumstances, is there. So when circumstances begin to provide, they should simply enhance your faith, your trust, and the belief in God. You shouldn't simply go uh, go in accordance to the circumstances or what people say. People are free to say because people see from the surface. People see just from the present, but they cannot see in the realm of tomorrow. They, they are not God. So their statements who they can make today, their judgment who they can make today, may be proved otherwise after a week or two or a month or a year. Why? Because if you are subject to God, if God spoke to you, if God made a promise to you, God is able to keep it. It's just a matter of time. But don't fall a prey to what people are saying, to what the devil is saying. Don't fall a prey to what circumstances are saying. God remains God regardless of the circumstances. God remains God regardless of what people say. God remains God regardless of what may be happening right in your life. He remains to be God. And that means whatever he said does not get altered. Because circumstances are proving otherwise. No. The Israelites were promised by God to go to the land of Canaan. It was not a smooth road. It wasn't a walk in the pack. It wasn't just a smooth walk, a smooth road. No. But still the word of God could sustain them even during those difficult moments. And that's why we keep hoping on what God has promised you, because He's not a man. Men will simply change the mind, then begin to act otherwise. So don't fall apart at what people are saying. Again, it's nobody can diffuse and nobody can object. Nobody can stop what God has said about not even circumstances. You may be the most difficult season of your life, but remember, the Word of God is able to help you ride over that control season that is not favorable. So you have to look at God and understand the nature of God. He is not a man that he should lie. And you must be able to, you know, can align yourself with what God has said, not what people are saying. I want to tell you this. People will say things. People and others will even prophesy presumptuously. They will say things. They will look at things from the surface and make declarations and tell you, you know what? Your life is doomed, you know. You, you are going to become nothing. Listen to me. Human beings are created beings and therefore they are limited where the future is concerned. Only God knows about your future and about my future. Those who make judgments based on your present are definitely going to be proved wrong as time goes by. But if you simply fall at prey to what you're saying and begin to simply, uh, you know, uh, begin to believe what they're saying, then the truth is you'll become the victim. But if I were you, I, will, I mean, if, if I were you, I would choose to believe God's word and run with it. I believe in God's word. I believe in what God has said to me. You ought to do this and believe because God spoke to you as a person. God called you as a person. 
God communicated when Christ came, he made it easy and possible for every person to access the Father without a second party or third party. You have the Holy Spirit who is able to reveal the mind of God and the heart of God to you as a person. Unlike in the Old Testament, someone had to go and speak to God on behalf of the people, the Israelites. But for you now, and we have the privilege, we are the New Testament church under the grace of God. We have the right to access the Father. There is no protocol. There is no, uh, like, you know, there is no status quo. You can access the Father from whichever place you are, in a small house, in your big house, on the road, anywhere. You can talk to Heavenly Father. And whatever God tells you by spirit, believe it and run with it. Don't let somebody who never heard God speak to you begin to talk you about, talk you out of it. It doesn't matter who that person is. If God has spoken to you audibly and clearly, please believe what God has said. God spoke to Abraham as a person. And the, what God told Abraham was going to affect generations after Abraham. By the time Balaam was coming to curse the Israelites, Abraham was not there. He was far gone. Literally gone. He was dead. These are now the fourth generation. Because Isaac was not there, Jacob was not there, now we are talking about what? Moses. So from Abraham to Moses or to the Israelites, the fourth generation now. And many more generations. In fact, you realize that actually when uh, Joseph died and the entire generation that was with him at that time, there rose a new generation. So you can imagine that new persons were born. And of course, Moses was their leader. So those are hundreds of years, but the Word of God was still alive. Can I tell you something? People that are trying to simply discourage you and try to talk you out of your destiny and out of your promise, God's promises, they don't have an idea that God's Word can stand all seasons. That Word went through all the hundreds of years and became was still active even during the time of Moses and the Israelites. That when Balaam showed up, God knew that Balaam was going to show up in the days ahead. God knew that people would speak control, and that's why He spoke to you prior to what people say. People are speaking to you based on the circumstances, but God spoke to you. He spoke because He knew what is going to befall you in the future. So believe what God spoke to you while you're praying, while you're seeking Him in the closet. Run with that word. Run with that promise. And don't give in to what the devil is saying in your life. Because God is true to his word. In the name of Jesus. I want you to look at this. Hebrew chapter number 6. Bible says from verse number 13 of Hebrews chapter 6 when God made his promise to Abraham he swore by himself God swore by himself he never swore by anything else by any other person because there is no one else greater than God God is the ultimate God is the creator I mean we are who we are today because of God so God swore to himself and look at what he said when he was making the promise to Abraham, he swore to him by himself, saying, Since he had no one greater by whom to swear. So there is no one great that can simply replace God. God is irreplaceable. Life is as a result of God. Saying, Blessing, I'll certainly bless you. Multiplying, I'll multiply you. So he's making this promise to Abraham. The reference in Genesis 22, verse 16, 17, you know, when he was about to sacrifice Isaac, not yeah, Isaac exactly, you know the story, but I want us to get there. Then he says, verse number 15, and it was that Abraham, believed, uh, having waited long, and he patiently realized and obtained in the birth of Isaac as a pledge of what was to come, what God had promised him. So Isaac, we know he came at the old age of Abraham, almost 100 years, after waiting for almost 25 years. Then, of course, Isaac came to the picture. Verse 16, the Bible says, Men swear by greater than themselves, which is true. 
I mean, at the end of the day, men, why do they show something greater? Because men are just like, we, we are weak persons. We cannot keep what we say. So we have to make like the way uh, politicians, when they are sworn in, some of the leaders in the government, they, they lift up their Bibles, others maybe lift up their crowns, and they swear that they are going to simply be faithful in their leadership, in their matters governance. Why? They can't say, but I swear by myself. No one on the planet Earth can ever say that. They have to swear with someone greater, and this is God at the end of the day. But God swore by himself. So the Bible says, men indeed swear by a greater than themselves, with, with them in all disputes, all taken for confirmation and final ending, uh, strive. According, uh, accordingly, God also in his desire to grow more convincingly beyond doubt to those who are to inherit the promise and changeableness of his pur a purpose and plan, intervened, mediated with an oath. This was so that by two unchangeable things, his promise, his oath, in which it is impossible for God ever to prove false or deceive us, we who have laid to him for refuge might have mighty dwelling, indwelling, strength, strong encouragement to grasp and hold fast and hope appointed for us, said before us. Now you see, God made a promise to Abraham, swore by himself or to himself rather, and he said to Abraham, I will do all these things, even to those that come to me later when Abraham is not there. This is the promise that I have made. And God has honored the promise to death and keeps honoring that promise. So it is impossible for God to ever, in fact, God cannot, his nature cannot even house a lie. His nature cannot even allow deception to come out of him. Why? Because that is who he is. There's no falsehood in God. Anything that God says, time may go, years may go, but whatever God says will always come to manifestation sooner than later. Now, look at your Bibles again. Uh, Joshua chapter 21. Joshua 21. Joshua 21, the Bible says, no, Joshua took over from Moses, now to usher them in the land of Canaan. The Bible says, verse 43, and the Lord gave to Israel all the land which he had sworn to give their, fa their fathers, they possessed it and dwelt in it. The Lord gave them rest around about, just as he had sworn to their fathers, not one of all their enemies would stood them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hands. There failed no part of any good thing which the Lord had promised to the house of Israel. All came to perish. Now look at this. The generation that were able to witness God promising, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so, they were not there, present to simply witness the unfolding of the promises of God. And that's why sometimes when God speaks to us, it goes beyond our generation and affects generations after us. So for us is to believe and to be persuaded, and that is passed over to the generations after. So now Joshua is simply, of course he was with Moses, you do understand pretty well, but he wasn't with Abraham, he wasn't with Isaac, he wasn't with Jacob at all, no. Generation of Joseph went on. Jacob died. So Joshua just came later. And of course, he walked along with Moses. So this particular time, Moses is in hotel. But Joshua is telling the Israelites that there is nothing that God promised us that has not come to fruition. Whatever God spoke, they were running with what God had promised. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all those generations. And now they're in a place where the manifestation has taken place. God is faithful to his word. He cannot fail you. He's not a man that he should lie. Don't doubt the word of God, not by any chance. Things may be difficult right now. Things may be challenging right now. But please hold on God's promise. Hold on God's word. He's not a man. Men will always lie. Human beings can lie. But God 
is not a liar. Anything he promises you, he will do it. It's a matter of time. Don't look at how many years I've gone. Don't look at how many days I've gone. No, don't look at that. Do you know how many centuries took place for these people to come and experience this? First, they were in Egypt for almost 400 years and 30. By the time they were leaving, Abraham was not there. It took hundreds of years, but the promise still came to pass. I want to encourage you today that no matter how long it has taken, whatever God has said, it will come to fruition. To the glory of his name. Look at what Samuel said here. First Samuel 15. Copies when Saul had disobeyed the Lord and was doing things contrary to what the prophet Samuel had told him. Now, now here is what was happening. Verse number 28. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has sworn the kingdom of Israel for, uh, has uh, torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, has given it to the neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not and also the strength of Israel, meaning God, will not lie or repent, for he is not a man he, and that he should repent. So Samuel is telling Saul, after Saul going contrary, that your kingdom is torn apart, and that one, there's no question about it. And then he said, He's, he who is the strength of Israel cannot lie, for he's not a man that he should lie. Are you seeing that? So Samuel is making clear to Saul that whatever God has said he's going to do it your kingdom is gone it is torn apart and of course that simply happened we do understand so god cannot lie whenever he says a word he'll be able to bring it to fruition now i want you also to look at uh, this particular promise that god also made in um, psalm 39 This was a promise that God was making to David. He says, Nevertheless, verse 33 of Psalm 39, Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not break off from him, nor my faithfulness fail to lie and be false to him. That is David. My covenant will I not break or profane or no alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, which cannot be violated. I will not lie to David. You see, God is making a promise to David and he said, I cannot lie to David. Then he says, his offspring shall endure forever and his throne shall continue as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, the faithfulness, witness, and the heavens. Now, it is very clear that God made that uh, verse, verse let, let's, let's look at verse 35 again. Once for all have sworn by my holiness, which cannot be violated, I will not lie to David. Then of course speaks about his offspring. You know, you know, so God promised David again. Now you do understand that a point in time, but Myers was blind at the time, when Christ showed up in the picture, he was crying for help from the Lord, and he said, Jesus, son of David. Because after David Christ emanated that offspring that God was talking about was largely about Jesus Christ because David equally was a person who the messianic promise emanated from him again the prophetic word that was being spoken to David was equally revolving around Jesus Christ that's why he said I'm going to raise up a righteous branch that is going to emanate from David it was simply meaning Jesus Christ I don't we do understand that Bible scholars, you don't understand that. Now, God never lied to David. Whatever God spoke to David has come to fruition now. Look at this. The first Kings. Chapter 8. This Solomon, the son of David, 
He says, verse 56, Blessed be the Lord who has given Israel, who has given rest to the people of Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of his good promise, which he promised through Moses, his servant. This is not just about David. He had promised Moses. And David also came in the picture. Now Solomon is testifying. He is testifying. And he says, May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. He may not leave us. Now, think about all this. Solomon, of course, was sitting up. He was now taking over from David and was able to authentically confirm that whatever God spoke to Moses, because they were able to simply look historically what Moses had simply said to the nation of Israel. And now Solomon is affirming that indeed every word that God promised, every good promise which he promised through Moses, his servant, it has come to pass. Now, Moses is not there. Solomon is there with another generation. They are witnessing the manifestation of God's promise which he spoke to Moses. Moses may have not been there to witness, but God's word never failed. Are you seeing that? People may discourage you, but within no time they are not in the picture, but you are there. Please hold on the promise of God. Now I want to close, but before I close, I want to show you this. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Number one, you need to understand 2 Corinthians 1 to the Bible says that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. All the promises of God. Don't forget that yes and amen in Christ. So any promise that God spoke, it is finds it is uh, settlement in Christ. And therefore there's no question about it. Now look at Titus. Chapter 1. Titus chapter number 1 verse number 2. The Bible says, The resting in hope of eternal life, which the ever-truthful God cannot deceive, promised before the world or the ages of time and now in his own appointed time he has made manifest made known his word and revealed it as his message through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior look at that it, it's very important you know This is a letter that was being addressed and Titus of course was operating closely with the Apostle Paul. We do understand that, those who are students of the Bible and you do understand pretty well. So the Bible says, if we look at verse number one, Paul, a born servant of God, an apostle, special messenger of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to stimulate, promote your faith of God's chosen ones and to lead them to an accurate discernment, recognition, acquaintance with the truth which belongs to and harmonizes with and tends to godliness resting in hope of eternal life which the ever truthful God who cannot deceive promised before the world or the ages of time so Paul simply say that God is truthful and can never lie we have been looking at the dominant subject, which is God is not a man that he should lie. So there is no any room for God to lie to us. Whatever God spoke from the time of Abraham up to date, the promises, others have taken place, others are taking place, others will take place. But in the realm of God, whatever God has said, it is already effected. It's now in the realm of man that we are seeing the manifestation. So I want to encourage you, please don't doubt God's promise. Remain hopeful and trust God where his promises are concerned. Men will disappoint you. Men will fail you. But God cannot fail you. Whatever he said, it's a matter of time. It shall come to pass. With what we've been able to share, you've seen the consistency of God's promises. And that makes it clear that indeed, God is not a man. That he should lie. God bless you. Do your good. Keep hoping. Keep trusting God. Sooner than later, 
you'll testify of God's goodness. You and the entire household. You and the commission that God has given you to run. You know, the mandate that you have, the vision that you have, the dream that you have. Sooner than later, it shall come to the limelight and it shall glorify the Lord. That's for now, trust God. Keep thanking God. Keep praying. Keep hoping in the Lord. People may discourage you. Don't fall in the discouragement. People may begin to speak in God. Don't fall into that. Just do what is ideal. That's what's needed biblically. Follow the biblical principles. Walk in the consciousness of God's principles. And do that which God expects you to do. And hold on His promises. You will not be disappointed. Sooner than later, you will be able to find yourself giving lifetime testimonies. Endless testimonies. Why? Because of God's faithfulness. Abraham live to see God's faithfulness. Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, David, Solomon, all these men and women of God, they were able to see God's faithfulness. You are not exempted. I'm not exempted. We are here in this particular generation to witness God's faithfulness taking place in our lives because God is not a man that he should lie. If God promised you, don't let man talk you out of it. If God is one who made a promise to you, no man can impede what God has said. Balaam tried, it never worked. Many people try, it will never work. Why? Because whatever God has said is bound by it. It has to come to fruition. So God bless you and do you good. Shalom. Peace. Amen.